Uh, here's an assembly with an old uh, crystal oscillator. It's a 16 megahertz output, probably about 20 years old, uh, so it's in a fairly large package compared to modern standards. Uh, let's uh, tear it down because the components will be a little bit easier to identify than uh, a modern uh, packaged oscillator, which of course have become quite a bit smaller than this. Okay, crack the can open and there's all the parts that were inside of it. It's a metal can because that prevents uh, air from going in and out, and that's important. Uh, you want it to be hermetically sealed because any change in air pressure or humidity would shift the frequency of the oscillator. Uh, the main component in white there is the uh, circuit board. It's created out of a ceramic material, and that's because ceramic has a low coefficient of expansion. That's very important because the quartz crystals mounted upon the, uh, that substrate using some springs. Let me just uh, insert the picture of a larger uh, view of it. Uh, two springs, basically, and that allows the quartz to vibrate freely. And, of course, that's what produces the master frequency. The other components that you find in the assembly, there's some uh, small discretes uh, that are used for capacitors. And um, you're going to then find, of course, the main integrated circuit. And, of course, we'll uh, de-encapsulate that uh, package, and uh, we'll see how it works um, and uh, see what's inside of it uh, coming up next. Okay, well, here's the actual uh, dye photograph of what was sitting inside that little black package. Uh, this is the silicon dye. And uh, very fortunately, there's markings on it which quickly allow me to figure out what's going on. It's marked as HA5004, that's the part number. Uh, A1 is revision, and NPC is the manufacturer. And with a little bit of Googling, you can find what NPC stands for, the Nippon Precision Circuits Incorporated. Uh, these are, of course, the designer of the actual integrated circuit. And with a little more Googling, you can find out that uh, NPC is now owned by Seiko. Uh, and, of course, Seiko heavily involved in timing, all sorts of things, everything from consumer watches uh, all the way into, like, Olympics, where they do the precision timing for uh, races. Not a huge surprise that Seiko would want to have a manufacturer who can design silicon to drive crystals because that truly is one of their uh, core competencies. Um, and they're still very much in business, the Seiko NPC Corporation, and of course there's their uh, address in Japan. Let's uh, come back to the uh, photograph and uh, see what we're looking at. We uh, are going to see that um, I've now marked the actual pads uh, in red here. These are basically the bond wires, these black things that come out to the package, and this is what becomes uh, electrically connected. Um, let's see, we're going to put in a little uh, block diagram from the data sheet to figure out what we're looking at here a little bit easier. There's XT and XT bar. Uh, those are basically the connections to the crystal. A standard crystal topology, you basically have a driver, an inverting driver that goes between the crystal. Then you have two load capacitors and a resistor, and that sets the voltage right in the middle. So you basically get an oscillation out of this. And then that is driven out. It looks like it goes to some dividers. It looks like there's probably the possibility of uh, putting some uh, dividers in. I suspect there might be some skews where they need a very low output frequency but they can't get the crystal to oscillate that low so they can actually do some selective metallization. But then eventually it all goes up to this uh, driver here. Now, this driver here will be uh, fairly powerful. It'll actually have some significant fits. So we should see some significant dye area for this particular inverter and also some significant dye area for this inverter. What else makes out the chip? There's basically an inhibit, so you can actually turn the oscillator off. Looks like there's a light little uh, pull-up resistor. I'm not sure if it'll be on the dye or if it'll be... Uh, actually something external, but then there's two uh, inverters, another inverter here, then a small FET. Now these will be relatively small in the die. They won't take up a lot of die area because it's a logical function. Let, let's see if we can sort that down. Let's go to the next photograph and see what we can see. Okay, so this is the uh, the entire die, and uh, here's a much more ghostly photograph. And of course, we might ask oh, what's going on. Uh, this is what's known as the top middle layer. Uh, basically, all this stuff that looks golden is a metal, it's a aluminum. And what happens is, uh, if you strip that out, you get the polysilicon layer here. Now, what the heck does that mean? Let me insert a photograph here, and uh, this is a side view of a typical semiconductor. Uh, classically, you've got a metal, you get a V and a metal. It's just like a circuit board. You can have a two-layer circuit board, you can think of that. Uh, but the component is actually below the metal. There's, there's going to be a pillar of metal form down here, and then basically this is what's known as a polysilicon. You get the big wafer, and then you get basically these wells, and this is how they construct transistors. So um, this is the whole thing. Uh, that's the polysilicon, and of course that's what the side view looks like. Okay, cool. Let's uh, come back here. So we have Q here, so we know that Q has a, probably some big, pretty big FETs associated with it. And sure enough, there's uh, some uh, FETs here, and some FETs here. And you can see they're slightly different. You can see that, um, let me see if I can zoom in here and uh, pan over a little bit. You can see that this is a FET structure here. There's basically the gates in the middle here, 
and there's a well and there's basically what happens here would have been a line here which would have been the actual gate and this is the source and the drain and now if you come up here it looks a little bit different because one's a p-fet and one's an n-fet but basically this is the pull up and this is the pull down that goes to the actual uh, transistor we just come back here so these two fets here uh, pardon me this is the same fet they just created it twice i believe that's to uh, solve some parasitic problems and this is a fet too there's basically two laid out but they're basically uh identical so we have a FET here and a FET here, and that's, of course, driving this transistor here. Now, same thing, crystal here, uh, in and out, we have to find some FETs. Now, they're a bit smaller. You can see there's one here, uh, and there's actually one here. So these are the two FETs that drive the XT. So, of course, well, what else are we looking at? Uh, in here, basically, is the small logic gates. We'll zoom into that in a minute, in a moment. Uh, we have an inhibit pin coming down here. Let's see if we need to zoom in. We basically have the metal coming up it goes across and um, it comes into what, what's the FET here basically uh, right here and uh, when the inhibit draws it basically this is the gate here it can prevent the XT from conducting and basically it would shut off the oscillator so uh, here we see actually a, a transistor uh, we see the basically gate and uh, the structure there okay neat let's um let's come up to this section here uh, and sort down what we're looking at all right, so uh, we've uh, zoomed into the logical gate section of the chip. There's uh, there's two uh, rows of gates. There's one here, and there's one here. And the way we can tell that is to go to the polysilicon layer. It becomes a little bit clearer. You can see a row here, a row here, a row here, and a row here. And of course, you might think, well, that's four rows, but actually, this is uh, two rows of gates. And let me explain that. Uh, if we go to this diagram I grabbed off uh, Wikipedia, this is a classic uh, two input NAND gate. Uh, a is the input, A, B is the input, and uh, the output, of course, is here. You have some N FETs on top and some P FETs below. And this is really classic. All the gates are constructed this way. And if you look how it gets laid out, basically they put a strip of metal on the top that'll connect all the gates together, and that's the power. A strip of metal on the bottom, that's the ground. And then they create basically diffusion wells and all sorts of interesting. Uh, Apologies to create these transistors, but no, here's a gate line and here's another gate line and basically here's the transistor and uh, This is the ends FETs up here and the P FETs below and if you look at the physical layout of the chip You can kind of divide it, you know, there's always a dividing line and if we come back to the polysilicon now You can sort of clearly see that uh, end FET structures up here P FET structures down here and then what happens is metal connects all this together to create the circuit you desire. Now this is a very old process node, so it's very visible, but quite frankly, even the most modern process node is essentially the same. It's uh, all these done like this, and then the, the actual routing is done uh, automatically through a computer program. Uh, but basically, you got some pillars coming up here, and there would have been a gate line here that got stripped away. That was the metal gate line. It would have come down here to the transistors down here. So if you come back to the actual uh, design, uh, you can see, uh, you know, here's uh, here's some interconnections um, connecting all the gates together and uh, forming some sort of logical function. Up here you see the power, and uh, down here you see the ground. Anyways, hopefully that was of interest. If so, give this video a thumbs up, and uh, we'll see you in the next one.